This is a fan-generated show. If you'd like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our new Rumble channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm thrilled to announce the release of my new book, Obama's True Legacy, How He Transformed America. There's a reason why Mike Huckabee calls it a ferocious and chilling read. Order it now at Amazon.com or at FrontPageMag.com. Good evening. Welcome to the Glasshoff Gang. Tonight, another fantastic program with another fantastic guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember, we are a fan-generated program, so we need all the help we can get. And even though the Lord has blessed us with Donald Trump, the shadow banning and persecution by the deep state has not disappeared overnight. So please subscribe to our YouTube and Rumble channels. Press instant notifications. Visit us at jamieglazoff.com. Subscribe to our newsletter. And hopefully donate if you have a little bit of extra finances to help us keep going. Follow us at Jamie Glazoff on Twitter and Facebook. But most importantly, our producer, Annie Cyrus, does much more than produce the Glazoff gang. She's on the front lines everywhere on so many fronts fighting for liberty and freedom throughout the world. Support her at liveuptofreedom.com. What an honor and privilege to have back, actually by popular demand, Jeff Cruer, talk show host, political analyst, and author of America's Last Chance. Jeff, what an honor to have you back. Janie, always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here, Jeff. Um, I want to start with this. This has kind of been on my mind. You see Kamala's recent latest video? I did. You know, there's a lot to say here. Um, first, I wouldn't even know where to start. Okay. Who is advising her? What is this? Um, is this some kind of drug dependency thing? Is it is it a, a substance abuse, a self-esteem speech? Um, is she hungover? It looks like a complete disaster. And uh, I think it's a reflection of what the campaign was all about. And I think what the Democratic Party is about. W what's your reading of this video of hers? Uh, well, uh, Jamie, it was pathetic. I mean, she was uh, slurring. She was uh, saying words that uh, didn't exist. She was glassy eyed. Uh, yeah, you know, she was unkempt. Uh, it, it looked like she, you know, had been hung over. <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, that's how it looked. And uh, she didn't look uh, clear, bold. Uh, she didn't inspire anybody. Uh, it was really pathetic. It was sad. And uh, it really reflected her campaign. I mean, she she blew through uh, $1.5 billion and ended up in the red. And uh, she had every advantage in the world from, you know, all the media behind her and uh, United Democrat Party. But um, she couldn't take advantage of that because she's just a very poor candidate. And Jamie, she doesn't know what she believes in. And maybe she doesn't feel like she can be honest with the American people. So she speaks in word salads and platitudes. Uh, I don't see a future for her, uh, Jamie. I really don't, politically. Thank you, Jeff. You, you hit on a a lot of these uh, important themes here, just in terms of what the left is. I, I think this is definitely about Kamala, but I think it's, it's also very reflective of what the left is and, and what, what it is and what it creates. Um, so in general, when I watch the left, it's always, I'm always like, Ugh. like, you know, when I watch The View, I'm always like, what is this? You know, Whoopi Goldberg is threatening to join the sex strike. It's like, am I supposed to have sleepless nights over this? I don't. So, um, so when Kamala was doing that, it's just, right. it's weird. But there was something that there was a whole bunch of things not sitting right with me. But I had this nausea, and there's one thing I was thinking about exactly. Uh, I'm specifically, okay, picture Donald Trump when he lost the election, doing a video going, you gotta believe in yourself. 
keep believing in yourself like that would be weird, right? And so when she was telling her viewer, when she was telling her followers, don't let anybody take your power away from you. What is like, Jeff, this isn't a, like when I think of an election, this isn't about me. Like this, like there's some kind of sick narcissism here, some kind of self-obsession that these leftists have. When I'm thinking about who's going to be the leader of the United States, it's not about my self-esteem and my power. What's on my mind? My mind is communism is not a good idea. It killed about 100 million people in the 20th century. It's probably not a good idea for communism to come to our country. Hmm, there's 400,000 missing children at the border. Probably not very good policies that, that uh, created that situation and the majority of those poor children are being sex trafficked um the defeat in afghanistan probably a huge disaster for the united states like this is what's on my mind and i think this is what should be on normal people's mind but in the democratic party this is somehow about me it's about me right or that's how they yeah. think so don't let anybody let you take your power away yeah. it's very it's very ref um, reflective and symbolic of the leftist mindset itself, isn't it? This is, it's a, it's a movement of narcissism and self-obsession. Um, and I would just end on this, that, you know, I remember this one priest, uh, his name is Father Mike. He does the uh, Bible in a Year series that I listen to. And in one and there's some things in the Old Testament that kind of sometimes don't make sense and they're confusing. And Father Mike always reminds the listeners, he says, it's not necessarily why, it's about who. And the answer is Jesus Christ. And why I bring that up is it's about Jesus. It's not necessarily about us on many levels. You see what I mean? But go ahead, Jeff. No, you, well, you made a lot of good points, uh, Jamie, and, and let me just uh, share a few with you. I, I think you're right. I think these uh, these leftists are very narcissistic, so I think it's about them. They lost sight of what the party really started with. I mean, the roots are a, a party that, that cared for the working man and woman, cared about the plight of people that were struggling. That's gone. So those people in the middle, those people that are working class, so those people that are struggling, they don't have a home in the Democrat Party because the Democrat Party is a party of the elite, the narcissists, the celebrities, the Wall Street types, your politicians. They care about uh, themselves and uh, making themselves look better and growing their power, their money, their influence. It's not about helping people. It's not about moving our country forward. So that's one of the reasons why they lost, because, of course, these blue collar voters have been moving toward Trump and they moved in big numbers in this election and the Democrats have lost their way. So Kamala just represents that perfectly. She's an empty vessel. She doesn't have any substance, but she's filled with uh, narcissism. She's all about, uh, you know, her uh, potential uh power. She was going to be the first uh, woman of color as uh, president. And it didn't work out because she couldn't really say anything that connected with the American people. The only thing they really had was hatred toward uh, Donald Trump. And you're not going to win an election just uh, based on hate and name calling, Nazi and fascists and all of that. So she is not uh, the future of the Democrat Party if they want to win. Now, if they stay with people like her, they're going to keep losing. The only way that they can possibly survive is to revamp their party completely, get back to their roots, get back to some sort of uh, principles and platform that help the American people and get away from this uh, nonsense, this wokeness, this elitism. And uh, we'll see. There's a struggle right now, Jamie, going on within uh, the Democrat Party right now. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. But I don't know. I don't know how they get away from something that's actually who they are because it's sort of like taking Muhammad out of Islam because the left 
you're making a great point. I'm, I'm just adding a footnote that when your entire life is based, identity is based on envy and jealousy uh, and trying to make yourself a God, I don't know what happens to you when you take that out. Um, and But you're absolutely right. If they don't switch this, uh, but but the complexity and tragedy is is that there's so many leftists at the same time. So, but let's just look into this disaster here because I was thinking like, who is she talking to? But then I was thinking, okay, so then they had Cardi B. To, now it turns out that this also this question of celebrities of giving money to celebrities. It look it turns out that that wasn't really very successful. So. You know, but now it turns out that some money was going to Al Sharpton, some money, it appears, was going to uh, Beyonce and some other people. Um, I'm not so sure about the Cardi B part because um, Cardi B was saying that she didn't uh, get any money, so maybe not there, but just celebrities in general. But, you know, I was just thinking, I don't know if you were... Um, lucky enough to have seen Megan the Stallion, you know, rapping and doing her dance. And, you know, that that's another reflection right there, Jeff. Just what are they thinking? Like, just in terms of the whole Megan the Stallion thing with the noises she's making on stage and the movement she's making on stage. First of all, it's not completely PG and family friendly, but I think there's another reflection right there on everything that's wrong, right? Well, it, it, you're right, because what, what uh, Kamala did was to try to bring in celebrities like her to build herself up. And a lot of times the celebrities would perform and people would leave uh, because they didn't come for Kamala. They came for the celebrities. And you can't build a campaign on that. I mean, she, she didn't do interviews. She didn't really uh, examine uh, the issues. She just gave us word salads and platitudes. She tried to fill it with uh, a bunch of fluff and these uh, celebrities. And, you know, the American people rejected it. Now, I have the updated numbers for you. So right now, uh, the popular vote totals, it, it looks like, uh, you know, you roughly got about 78 million that uh, Donald Trump has. But the sad thing is that uh, Kamala Harris is going to end up with like 76 million votes. So Trump's going to win the popular vote by a few million, uh, but he's below 50% now because they're still counting, if you can believe that, uh, Jamie. And as more votes come in, the, the margin gets a little bit closer, but she's still going to lose the popular vote. So that just gives you an idea. I mean, we still have that many people in the United States who voted for uh, a word salad candidate who offered nothing. And I think a lot of that was just fueled by fear that they created about Donald Trump. And if Trump can succeed, and I've got every uh, belief that he will, I think he's going to just grow and grow and grow the party so that more people will say, hey, he's not bad. He's good for this country. We support him. And his demonization was a big lie. So I think he's got a lot of potential to continue to grow support. I mean, I saw the polls. Uh, his uh, transition has got high approval. So I think it's going to continue to to grow, and, and he's going to become more popular as uh, time goes on, Jamie. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, just uh, all, also all these lies and then how the Democrats deal with the lies. So he's Hitler, he's Hitler, he's Hitler. Oh, he just won. Can we meet for lunch? So Scarborough Joe and even with Biden, the way he's smiling and really happy to have Trump there, even though we know people are acting, but something was kind of surreal there as well. But, you know, they call this, this they call Trump Hitler then he wins and they want to have lunch and be buddy-buddy all of a sudden. Just, it's very weird. Uh, but let's continue the weirdness here. So, yeah, I just wanted to touch on that. Just uh, Kamala's video and telling people not telling her supporters to still believe in themselves as if there's maybe not higher issues involved. So very reflective of what the left is. I think we've made our point there. So let's continue the weirdness here. Everybody that's watching, make sure you're reading Jeff Kuwer's articles because, uh, Jeff, you've got a very powerful, brilliant article out on the Ukraine dimension here. But um, 
and not a but and I've been reading your stuff also watching your stuff and so you're making some very important points here we've got a president right now who doesn't know the name of the basketball team that's being recognized in the White House he's walking into rainforests he he's gone he's not all there so we don't know who's leading the country but we we might guess as to who's leading the country but so you've written about this in your very profound recent article Trump is talking about bringing peace to the uh, Russia-Ukraine war. It appears that Putin and Zelensky, Russia, Ukraine, somewhere are ready for peace and that Trump has something to do with it. So while Trump is talking about peace, this guy that's wandering around in a rainforest all of a sudden thinks it's the really right time to encourage Ukraine to launch U.S. intercontinental inter missiles into Russia. So Trump wants to bring peace to the war right before his inauguration. Let's escalate the war. What's the psychology here? You know, uh, Jamie, it, it's it's highly disturbing. So you, you consider we've got 50 some odd days uh, until Donald Trump becomes president, until this man finally leaves. As you say, he's mentally incompetent and his vice president could be a drunk. So we, we've got, we don't even, we don't want to, we don't have no leadership and people behind the scenes, the deep state, whoever are pulling the strings. So he wants peace. He's talked about peace. The American people voted for peace. He said that he was going to end this war quickly. Instead of following that, that we just won on that message what Biden is doing is now doubling, tripling down. You know, they're launching these uh, long range missiles into Russia, provoking Putin, needlessly trying to provoke Putin, in my opinion. And I could be trying to set the stage for some sort of world war. And, uh, you know, maybe you would think that one of the reasons is to create some kind of catastrophe where they can retain power, mm. where they can stay in office where they can uh, postpone, if not uh, cancel, the uh, inauguration of the new president. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't put anything past these people. They're evil. Uh, these are people that do not have our best interests at heart. Talk about selfish. They're all about their selfish interests. The warmongers, the neocons, the military-industrial complex. You know, since February of 2022, 20, uh, hundreds of thousands of people have died. This thing, if Donald Trump would have been president, Jamie, would have never happened. But under this administration, it has turned into a conflict that keeps getting worse and worse. We should be leading the effort to bring about peace. But instead, all we're doing is funneling money to Ukraine. And, and I've got no doubt, Jamie, a lot of that money is being siphoned off. A lot of that money is being stolen. A lot of that money is coming back to uh, deep state interests in this country and going to corrupt people in uh, Ukraine. It's a money laundering operation. So we've got uh, a real necessity that Donald Trump take office. He, uh, he announced uh, General Kellogg is going to be his envoy, his peace envoy, to try to bring about a solution. That's a very competent individual. So I, I'm hoping and praying that we can get to January 20th so that we can have a president who's committed to a peaceful solution. Well, thank you, Jeff. And as you're bringing up this military industrial complex, we just see how how complicated all of this is because it's not just about like look if you want to find an anti-communist in, in the world you're looking at one so do i know who putin is absolutely um you know i grew up reading robert conquests the harvest of sorrow and and learning about the forced Ukraine famine and what the Soviets did to Ukraine and to the Ukrainians. Of course, I'm for the Ukrainian people. Of course, I'm for all people that want freedom. And this, of course, is, is, Sov is Soviet imperialism. And of course, we're for Ukrainian independence and freedom. But is that really what this is about now? So, you know, growing up, I was also hoping and for when I was studying about the Vietnam War, of course, 
I wanted the defeat of the Viet Cong and of the North Vietnamese. But the more I studied and looked into it, was that war really about trying to defend South Vietnam? I don't know, because the United States could have won. And uh, let's look at Afghanistan. Was that war really about trying to defeat Al-Qaeda and the Taliban? So I sobered up in life in a lot of ways and began to realize that there's other forces up top that are pulling strings and things are not as simple as I thought that they were. So are we for Ukrainian independence for Ukrainian people? Are we against uh, Putin's Russia marching into a country to take its freedom? Of course not. But is that what this war is about? What is this war about in your view, Jeff? I, I, I think it's uh, about enriching uh, certain elites uh, I think it's uh, about covering up our tracks in uh, Ukraine, where we've been uh, heavily involved for years. Uh, we had bio uh, labs in Ukraine. That that issue has sort of been swept under the rug. Uh, you brought about uh, brought up Afghanistan brilliantly, Jamie. And let's just look at that. We were in there twenty years. You know, when you count Afghanistan and Iraq, all the money we spent, and all the money we are going to be spending uh, taking care of the victims. Because, of course, there were plenty of people that uh, came back forever changed. The cost we're looking at is between four and six trillion dollars. Now, we went in, the Taliban was in charge. We left, the Taliban was in charge. We went into Iraq to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Now there's a government there that's allied with Iran. So what did we accomplish uh, in Iraq? What did we accomplish in uh, Afghanistan? Uh, except uh, bringing about uh, pain and suffering for many of our heroes and their families. And they're just, it's just tragic. And then I don't want to see us getting involved uh, in another war that is halfway around the world when we have got an invasion that's been going on in our country now for four years, and we have got terrorists that are roaming our country because we've got two million gotaways, and you know that those are uh, terror cells in that number. So we're not even taking care of our own people. We're not really taking care of the people of Ukraine. We're just taking care of the elite and the military industrial complex. And Jeff, and so when you study it, you know, they, they, they show about Blackwater and all these other forces. So you destroy Ukraine and then you rebuild Ukraine and people profit from that. Then you've mentioned uh, on, on this show just a couple minutes ago, so they send a whole bunch of money to Ukraine, but where's the money really going? And a lot of evidence suggests that a lot is being channeled and funneled back into the Democrat Party. Uh, I'm not so sure that the Biden administration was really motivated uh, in this whole enterprise um, by the desire to really help Ukrainians. Oh, I think that was last on their on their list. I, I really do. Uh, it, it's uh, it's been about to, to help their their powerful moneyed interests uh, that are well connected in their party. And uh, just look at uh, the numbers. I mean, if we were really interested, uh, we would have been trying to bring a resolution to this, so hundreds of thousands wouldn't have died. Uh, we could have used our influence to to get a better deal for Ukraine. Uh, but we haven't been, and we haven't been doing anything. And all we've been doing is pumping money into it. Biden's trying to send another $24 billion, uh, Jamie, before he leaves. He just forgave uh, $5 billion uh, that uh, Ukraine uh, owes us. He's doing this all without congressional uh, approval. And a lot of this money that he sent there uh, has been uh, not authorized by, by Congress. So Russia, and I agree with you about Putin, he's no angel. He's a dangerous man, dangerous man. But Russia is the largest nuclear power in the world. So we have got to come to grips with the fact that we're, we're provoking a country that has more nuclear warheads than we have. And that he's already said that these missiles are now causing him to change uh, their policy concerning the use of nuclear weapons. So do we want to test that? I mean, do we want to just say, OK, we're just going to we're going to provoke him and, and hope that he's not going to follow through on his threats? Yeah, uh, I don't know if that's a good strategy to to rely on these next 50 plus days, Jamie. 
Absolutely. And again, I stress that, you know, where the Glazov gang stands is for the Ukrainian people to decide their own fate and how they want to live and their own society and without intrusion by imperialistic uh, forces that Putin represents. But let's be honest about the situation we're facing and what's really happening there and what the Democrats and Biden are really motivated by. So something seems very strange that just with a little bit, few days before the inauguration of a president that is ready to bring peace to a conflict, Biden is escalating it, right? Exactly. And let's not forget what the Ukrainian people want. Let's listen to the Ukrainian people. A new poll that just came out showed 52% of the Ukrainian people want a negotiated end to this war now. Only 38% of the Ukrainians want to continue the conflict. Here in America, 51% of the American people say no more arms, uh, no more military equipment to Ukraine. We just elected Donald Trump. The people in Ukraine, the United States of America are saying, all right, it's time to, to do something to bring about peace. Yet we're not going, we're going in the opposite direction. And, you know, I, I worry about where this is going to lead because now Britain and France are talking about preemptively, preemptively striking uh, Russia. They're talking about uh, adding yeah. their own troops into uh, Ukraine. And this and is while, going it, on right before Donald Trump takes office, Jamie. And, and right while they're talking like that, Putin is announcing that Russia is going to lower the threshold to use nuclear weapons. Uh, and wow, I wonder if it's a coincidence if this is just a few days before Trump hopefully gets into the White House. Look, Putin thought this was going to take a couple days, if not a couple weeks. Jeff, what happened? Why did why did Putin's Putin's Russia in the end was unsuccessful in taking Ukraine, right? Well, I think the Ukrainian people uh, showed uh, courage, uh, fought hard for their for their country, and uh, you know was able to prevent Putin from taking over the whole country. So now he's got the eastern part of uh, Ukraine. And there's been a stalemate there. They go back and forth and back and forth. And then Ukraine actually has uh, their forces in, in part of Russia right now. So they're in Russia. Russia's in Ukraine. This thing uh, is uh, escalating because North Korean troops are now uh, involved. We're talking about, uh, you know, maybe British and French troops. We've now sent uh, missiles deep into Russia. We're sending more of them. We're giving them more money for uh, for armaments. So instead of uh, you know, ratcheting down toward peace, things are spiraling out of control. So this is a very worrisome time, uh, Jamie, that uh, I think President Trump obviously has got his eyes on because I think behind the scenes, hopefully through third parties, he's talking to both Zelensky and Putin to tell them, hey, I'm gonna be getting in there soon and we're gonna change this whole dynamic. Thank you, Jeff. We're going to take a quick break with our sponsors. We'll be right back. Looks like you've been sleeping well. Megan, he's back. The My Pillow guy. And you're looking good. I'm still feeling good. Well, just when you thought it couldn't get any better, we've got the best pillow ever. My Pillow 2.0. <gasps> wow, it's so soft and smooth. It's cool to the touch. How did you do that? Well, we took my pillow's patented bill and combined it with this new technology that we didn't have back then when I invented my pillow to bring you the best pillow in history, my pillow 2.0. Just like all of you, I never imagined that my pillow could get any better. That's why I haven't changed it in nearly 20 years. Then I heard about a revolutionary new technology and I knew I had to bring it to you all. My Pillow 2.0 is truly the next generation of My Pillow. The My Pillow 2.0 is cooler and softer than the last My Pillow. It is so comfortable to sleep on at night. I look forward to going to bed and I wake up well rested in the morning. Sleep is all about temperature and height. My Pillow 2.0's patented adjustable fill is going to give you the exact individual support you need from your head to your bed. And now here's where it gets even better. 
We've all experienced those temperature-related sleep interruptions where you get too hot, you toss and turn, you flip your pillow over to the cool side. Well, all that's gone with my brand new MyPillow 2.0 cooling fabric that's made with temperature-regulating thread. The best sleep just got even better. Whether you have a MyPillow or not, you need to get the brand new MyPillow 2.0. Call or go to MyPillow.com now. Use your promo code, and for a limited time when you buy one, you'll get a second one absolutely free. You're sleeping even better. And cooler, too. And you're looking good. Feeling good. I knew you would. Visit MyPillow.com. And that's right. Make sure to go to MyPillow.com or MyStore.com and use promo code GG21. You can get a discount of up to 60% off on all the amazing products. And you're going to be helping out Mike Lindell as well as the Glazoff gang. And if you like one-of-a-kind handmade art, make sure to go to LUTFstudio.com and purchase resin art pieces by the one and only, our producer, Annie Cyrus. Use promo code GLASSOFF to get special discounts. You're going to be helping out the GLASSOFF gang as well as the great Annie Cyrus. We are back with the wonderful scholar and gentleman, Jeff Cruer. Jeff, welcome back to the program. Oh, it's an honor to be with you, Jamie. Thank you. Jeff, the FBI needs a director. What do you think? Some say it might be Cash Patel. Wouldn't that be wonderful? What do you think about, just in general, some of the cabinet appointments and what kind of FBI director uh, maybe ideally we should have? We, uh, we need an FBI director who's going to clean house, uh, Jamie. We need an FBI director who's going to bring the FBI back to the roots of... Uh, uh, what the organization was created for. We need to get it away from the political uh, operations that they've been involved in, in in recent years. Remember, they were spying on Donald Trump from the very beginning. So the FBI was weaponized against Donald Trump. They raided his home with gun-toting agents. We can never forget that. So Christopher Ray has got to go, uh, Jamie. He has got to go. Cash Patel would be fantastic. Uh, I keep hearing rumors it's going to be Cash Patel. I hope it is Cash Patel. Overall, I mean, I think um, the cabinet appointments have been good. Uh, the, the, the more MAGA the person is, the more I like them. I, I was a big fan of Matt Gates. I'm sorry that uh, that didn't work out because, you know, Jamie, when you watch Congress and you watch uh, Christopher Ray and Merrick Garland being grilled, the person that grilled them the best and the hardest was Matt Gates, And he was a guy of tremendous courage and someone who really went after what he saw as wrongdoing. So they leaked, they leaked this report about uh, Matt Gates. That was NSA or some sort of deep state, got the information out to sabotage his uh, nomination. He backed out. And of course now we have Pam Bondi and, and I hope she's gonna be strong. I hope she's gonna be very strong. Because that's the one problem Donald Trump had in his first term. He had too many establishment Republicans. He didn't have enough loyalists. He didn't have enough MAGA cabinet members. And I'm hoping, you know, all these people are going to be loyal and committed to the Make America Great Again agenda. Thank you, Jeff. You know, when I was looking at Obama at that funeral when he was talking to Biden, and then the way he was speaking at some of those uh, campaign events for Kamala, the way he was reprimanding, you know, the brothers, as he was saying uh, about how they're not voting for Kamala, he, he not just looked upset, he looked worried. And I'm thinking, I think he has a lot to worry about. And what I'm tying this into is if Trump comes in and brings in all these great people, and they start looking into what the CIA has been doing, what the IRS has been doing, what the CIA has been doing, what Obama was doing. Um, maybe people like Obama and others might get into a little bit of trouble. What do you think? I think that's a very shrewd point. Uh, he did look worried. He, uh, he wasn't the, remember Obama used to be happy-go-lucky and Mr. Cool and uh, someone with a lot of charisma all that was gone. It was a, a Obama that was scolding people, an Obama that was yelling about Trump, an Obama that was worried. So you're right. He never paid any price for Benghazi, for Fast mm -hmm. and Furious, for sicking the IRS on Tea Party groups, 
for yeah. laying the trap that ensnared Donald Trump in the whole Russia collusion nonsense, because that was all phony, as you know, Jamie. Yeah. And Obama was the mastermind of all that. They met in the White House with Joe Biden. They laid that trap. So he could be vulnerable to some sort of uh, investigation about his participation in all this, as mm -hmm. could Biden, as could a lot of these uh, players that have never paid any price. Mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton never paid any price for what she did, uh, Jamie. So yeah. I'm not looking for retribution. I'm just looking for justice. Let's just have a DOJ that'll be a Department of Justice, not injustice. And I hope uh, we'll yeah. have that under this uh, AG. Now, speaking of justice, Jack Smith, it appears, has surrendered. I mean, look, they tried to kill Trump. He turns this way some kind of miracle. They try to do this, this, this. I mean, they have tried everything. Then all, all of this lawfare, but it looks like all of these lawsuits are crumbling. What do you think of the Jack Smith surrender and, and the, other, uh, the other lawsuits? You know, it was all lawfare, Jamie. It was all to uh, destroy Trump. Uh, he he came down that escalator nine and a half years ago, and it has been an unrelenting uh, attack on him. Every possible way they could do it, they did it. And the lawfare was just part of it. The mugshot, the raids, the impeachments, the indictments, the criminal uh, convictions, the civil cases, all of it was to try to stop him and he said it in a post the other day, he said, against all odds, he persevered and he won. And he did it with uh, the help of God Almighty, because this is a man who's uh, protected by God. You, you, you just said it in that assassination attempt. A millimeter here, a millimeter there, he's dead on live national TV. And it was only through God that he is uh, with us today. There's no other human on earth in my opinion, that could have survived what he survived. I mean, Sylvester Stallone, I don't know if you heard his comments at Mar-a-Lago, said that he's almost a mythical character. He called him the second uh, George Washington. It's, right. uh, it's God. God has saved this man for this country at this time. And we're so blessed to have him in place. And uh, that's why I'm 100% uh, behind him because of the importance of what he's doing. But these enemies... They're not going away, Jamie. The enemies are still there. They're still going to be trying to sabotage everything he's doing. Well, look at all the death threats uh, that occurred today towards a lot of the cabinet picks, right? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, even Matt Gates was one of them, uh, former cabinet uh, nominee, and all these others, Elise Stefanik and Tom Homan, you know that they're going to try to stop uh, Tom Homan because he's talking about getting serious about deportations and and uh, he's got a big job in front of him. So all of these people need to be protected because they're going to be implementing the uh, Trump agenda, which these uh, opponents are going to be steadfastly opposed to. And that's the problem with these people on the other side. Uh, they engage in violence. They uh, they don't have the the ability to try to, you know, give Trump a chance. They want to just uh, oppose and condemn uh, everything he's doing without even an opportunity for his policies to succeed. You know, last time he got elected, Jamie, they started impeachment before he even took the uh, oath of office. Madonna, mm -hmm. on the first day he was president, was talking about blowing up the White House. They, he never had a honeymoon, never had a chance. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping this time there'll be enough of the people on the left, like Bill Maher says he wants to give Donald Trump a chance. Hopefully there'll be enough of people like that that'll say, all right, let's see if his policies can work. We've got J6 people in prison uh, for just walking around. But uh, somebody that says they want to blow up the White House when Trump comes in, I wonder how much time Madonna did in jail for that. Hmm. Zero, as did uh, Johnny Depp, who said I uh, wanted to assassinate uh, the president, yeah. as did Robert De Niro, who multiple yeah. times said he wanted to punch out uh, the president, as Kathy Griffin holding up a bloody head of the president. Uh, nothing happened to any of these people. Uh, they make threats against him constantly. But that's justified because the left is the party of joy and they have a right to threaten and inflict violence on those racists and racists and
fascist Republicans. Jeff, this is going to be very interesting. Uh, Trump is throwing out some hints that uh, maybe the establishment media might not be uh, filling up the briefing room anymore. And we might have seats for new media now that's not necessarily establishment media, but podcast media, online media, etc. So we might even, <laughs> instead of having these uh, CNN people or MSNBC people, whatever these uh, brainwashed uh, Communist Party members have been doing in there, we might have a Joe Rogan, we might have a Megyn Kelly. This would be very exciting would be very fresh and I think would be fairer, right? Oh, I 100% agree. Uh, aren't you sick of seeing these these people at these uh, press briefings in the White House? Uh, all of them, except for the one guy from Fox, uh, are just uh, in bed with uh, the Biden administration. They ask them the most ridiculous questions about nothing, ice cream, movies. Uh, they don't ask hard hitting questions. Let's get rid of them. NPR, we shouldn't even be funding NPR, okay? That that needs to go. Uh, get rid of uh, all these MSNBC and all the New York Times and Washington Post. I would love to see a whole revamping of the, the way that press secretary uh, deals with the, with the press and make it representative of the people. Look at the presidential election. One of the reasons I think Trump won is he went on all these podcasts. And the people are watching shows like yours. They're not watching uh, the evening news with, uh, you know, uh, Lester Holt and all these uh, left wing hacks. I mean, their numbers are way down, Jamie, and they're going to continue to drop. So let's get them out of the uh, briefing room. I think that's a good idea. That would be awesome. I want to see Roseanne Barr in there. I want to see Alex Jones in there. This this would be wonderful. Carl, how about Tucker Carlson? Tucker Carlson. Yeah. Jeff Jeff Cruer, Annie Cyrus. I'm ready. I'm ready. I think it would be great. I mean, I think how about a rotating uh, list where you 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 bring in different people, uh, mm -hmm. or maybe you, you take it on the road and you, you bring in uh, different reporters from different areas of the country. Mark Levin. Have Mark Levin in there. Yeah. Right. I think uh, we need to decentralize all this power that is yeah. concentrated in Washington and spread it out over the country. Absolutely, Jeff. So the pogroms, very scarily enough, are coming to the West in our cities. The jihadists that the left has brought in in waves, they are here. And so we know what happened in Amsterdam now just recently in Montreal, the jihadists literally setting Montreal on fire. And meanwhile, Justin Trudeau is just partying at the uh, Taylor Swift concert that night. It just, if you want to know what the left is, that was the picture right there. Jihadists burning Montreal and uh, Justin Trudeau singing along to Taylor Swift songs. I mean, you can't get any more pathetic. Could you comment on that? I, I think Justin Trudeau is a disgrace. Uh, I have a lot of Canadian friends and I, I really feel sorry for them, uh, Jamie, that they've got to live under that kind of a tyrant. Uh, what they did during COVID to the uh, folks involved in the Freedom Convoy and the people that were just trying to have free speech reprehensible. I do think there is a movement in Canada uh, that is going to, that's emulating uh, the Trump MAGA movement here. And hopefully that'll continue to grow and we'll, and we'll see some freedom back in Canada. Uh, unfortunately, we got a socialist. Uh, so we're in between two socialist nations. We got a socialist leader of Mexico, who, by the way, is changing her tune now after talking to Donald Trump. And we have a socialist uh, prime minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, whose real father, by the way, Jamie, whose real father is Fidel Castro, as we know. So yeah. he's got communism in his blood. Mm. So he is, uh, he's a disgrace and, and the Canadians are, are living under uh, just reprehensible rule. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, they will move in a different direction. We see it in El Salvador. We've yeah. seen it in Argentina. We hopefully need to see the freedom movement grow. It could be happening in Romania. We see it in Hungary. 
So now maybe people will feel emboldened now that Donald Trump has uh, been elected here. But as far as the uh, jihadists, I am worried about uh, what's happened over the past four years because I think they're sleeper cells. I think they're positioned uh, all over the country, Jamie. And we definitely can see where I'm not necessarily criticizing the police um, as individuals or even I think that they're getting orders. So so in another thing is whether you follow the orders. So in UK, Tommy Robinson is in prison for making a movie about, uh, excuse me, making a documentary about the sex trafficking of uh, young uh, British girls by uh, the Sharia followers, if that's one way to describe it. So he's in prison for that while these Sharia followers and jihadists are all over the streets of the UK and nothing is being done to them. And the police are arresting the people that want to protect England from Sharia. So it's happening here as well, as we know. And just recently in Toronto, uh, the Rebel News CEO and founder Ezra, Ezra Levant was arrested for filming the pro-Hamas demonstration. So the authorities are going at the people that are trying to expose what jihad is rather than cracking down on jihad. And as some authorities in Britain have whispered and also said to the freedom fighters, they say, hey, look, there's more of them than there are of you. So our authorities in the West are afraid to confront the jihadists and arresting people like journalist Ezra Levant. That is uh, very scary, uh, Jamie, because uh, that that outfit does a great job in Canada. Uh, Tommy Robinson, I think, is uh, a man who believes in freedom and, and telling the truth. And of course, they're going after him and his supporters. They don't really have freedom of speech. I mean, they don't have the First Amendment. So we've got the First Amendment in this country. That's what makes us so unique. I mean, we have these rights, these precious rights. And remember what Biden did to us uh, during COVID. He tried to take away our First Amendment rights. Yeah. Uh, they tried to censor us uh, online. They tried to force us to uh, wear masks, force us to uh, take uh, vaccines. You know, we honored here in uh, New Orleans the other day with a group I'm involved in, the, the federal judge who issued the key rulings against all of these crackdowns. He was based in uh, North Louisiana. Uh, Terry Doughty is his name. And he's a courageous, one of the few courageous judges that would issue rulings saying what Biden did was an attack on our First Amendment rights. Mm. And it was. So we need to get back to exercising those uh, free speech rights and I think we are under, you know, under President Trump and and uh, hopefully we'll never go through the four years. This has been hell, Jamie. It's been been hell on uh, the American people. You're absolutely right. How refreshing to uh, have the good guys win for a change and to be coming in, hopefully. <coughs> Excuse me. Annie Cyrus, what do you think of our discussion this evening? Well, let me first pick up from where you guys just concluded, and then I do have a few uh, questions for Jeff. It's it, it's it, it. We are all very grateful. Uh, President-elect, uh, Lord willing, 50-plus days, and he will be in charge again. But I, I do want to agree with Yes, we will be hopeful, but remember, last four years confirmed at least by their own shadow government, uh, we have more than 2,000 sleeper cells in America. If all fails, they won't hesitate to unleash them. So more than ever, the first year of President Trump, we need to play our role locally. See something, say something. Notice, D don't go happy countries coming back to normal because these people aren't going to give up. And, and not to drag this too long, but with all the changes that is taking place in the Islamic Republic of Iran, including possibility of replacing the supreme leader to have a younger supreme leader who can, quote unquote, stand up to Trump, we're, we're not past the terrorist uh, danger yet. It's going to take a good year, depending on who's in charge of what. We might get it under control, but please be careful and pay attention and all of your lovely, nice, moderate, beer-drinking, pork-eating neighbors aside, there are still 
about 2,800 mosques across this country. Now, that being said, uh, Jeff, if you want to make a comment, go ahead. No, I mean, I think you you uh, hit the nail on the head. I mean, we're, we're going to be in a very dangerous uh, period for quite a while because of what's been done to our country. When you allow in 20 million people, you allow in people from 170 nations, you allow in people that are terrorists, that are jihadists. And uh, yeah, they're set up all over. And uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think they're going to be uh, looking to uh, commit acts of terrorism, no doubt about it. So that's why I think the work of uh, Tom Homan and the Border Patrol is so important. I mean, we got to immediately secure the border. So we got to stop the bleeding. And then we have to start the, uh, the long, slow, but important process of deporting uh, these people that are here illegally, that are lawbreakers. Agreed. Now, here's a question for you, or more like, what are your predictions? Completely uh, something that I feel like it's going unnoticed. A few days left for Biden. What do you think he's going to do for his son, Hunter Biden, before leaving the office? I don't think he's going to do anything with Hunter. Uh, I think Donald Trump might commute his sentence uh, when uh, he's already hinted at doing that. So I think uh, he's already um, got a good feeling that Trump is going to do it. And, and Trump said he was going to do it to try to bring the country together. You know, my my view on this, uh, Annie, is Republicans always try to play the nice guy. And uh, Republicans always want to, uh, you know, reach out to the Democrats and work with them and, you know, be neighborly and, you know, forgive and forget. Democrats never act like that toward uh, Republicans. I mean, they, they never do. It's cutthroat. Look at what they did to Donald Trump. So I think if the roles were reversed and it was uh, Donald Trump Jr. looking at uh, a long prison sentence, I don't think uh, Kamala Harris would be uh, pardoning him. So I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but I think um, President Trump has hinted that uh, that's what he's going to do. Yes, and and I agree with you, but but I, I I'm going to have the unpopular opinion here, as you mentioned at the beginning or early on in this uh, episode. This country, it, we 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 are beyond one commute sentence to be united again. Less than half of this country still think Kamala Harris should be the president. That mindset won't change over one move by Trump. So I personally pray that he doesn't, because as you said, justice needs to be served. And what Hunter Biden has done, he needs to face the consequences. Now, very yes. last question, I promise. This is the last question. Um, with the cabinet and the picks, and of course, there are still many positions to be filled. But there's another major move that's going on in the country, and that is the mainstream media. So between the two options, going to buy MSNBC, which one is your preferred, Elon Musk or Jack Pazobiec? That's interesting uh, because uh, I, I do think Elon Musk uh, is serious about it. Uh, it seems like, uh, you know, that became sort of uh, an odd suggestion. I think it was Donald Trump Jr. who made the suggestion, and then all of a sudden... You know, Elon Musk uh, jumped on it. Uh, I mean, he's, he's the richest man in, in the world. You know, in, in just the, the past few months, his, uh, his wealth has grown by tens of billions of dollars. So he is, I mean, he's just, I mean, he could buy MSNBC in a blink of an eye. It would be nothing to him. So uh, I, I, I think that might very well happen. I mean, I hope it does. I mean, MSNBC is a disaster. I mean, I watch them just to see what the other side is doing. And I mean, they're worse than CNN. At least CNN has a token conservative on there. Uh, Scott Jennings, who at least is able to present the other side. I don't see that on uh, MSNBC uh, at all. If I could just say one other thing about pardons, um, one thing that's near and dear to my heart are the uh, J6 uh, prisoners. And uh, I hope President Trump is gonna pardon all of them. I would like to see a blanket pardon of all of these people that have been in jail, some of them for years without their day in court, without due process, without a trial, for walking into the Capitol. Uh, these people were not carrying, uh, you know, machine guns. I mean, they weren't trying to, uh, you know, blow up the Capitol. 
Uh, they were there because they believed the election had been stolen and they're in jail unjustly. So I really hope they're all going to be pardoned, uh, guys. That's that's what I'd like to see on day one. Yes, I'm with you on that. Agreed. And quickly back to Elon, even though I am not an Elon Musk fan, I will credit the man. He fixed X. He yes. has proven on his resume, if he does take over MSNBC, we might have a, a strong truth-telling uh, mainstream media back on air again. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you so much, Jamie. And I know we just, uh, you know, passed the Thanksgiving Day official. It's, but I just wanted to say that on behalf of myself and Dr. Jamie Glazov and everyone else behind the scene of Glazov Gang, we definitely are very grateful to all of our audience who have loyally stayed with us for the last 13 years. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Annie. And uh, gratitude is the theme of the day. Jeff Cruer, there's a lot of people sitting on the edge of their seat right now that might not be following you. Where do they go and what do they do? Well, uh, thank you, Jamie, for uh, having me and Annie. It's always an honor to be with you guys. It's just a great discussion always. So the best place they could go is uh, my website, which is my last name, crewair.net. And I have links there to uh, my columns and, and shows and and uh, all the work that I do, my book. And uh, I do have a poll up right now where I'm asking uh, who the biggest loser was in the 2024 election. People can chime in on that. My new video was up there about the cabinet. So they can check that out at my last name, Crew Air, C R O U E R E dot net. Awesome. I want to ask your and Annie's opinion. I've been practicing it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think? Am I getting there? Uh, Was it good? Practice makes perfect, Jamie. So, you, okay, now Jeff, you want to try or the next time? I, I, I mean, yeah, it's it's more of like a, it's not. I think it's more of like, you know, it's, it's closer in like this, you know? And then of course, then he gives the old, the golf swing. <laughs> so It's so awesome. It's so awesome. And uh, Annie, maybe one day you will do the Trump dance for us, right? <laughs> I would say you gentlemen definitely have it mastered much better than I have. I, I, but I will try. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for joining the glass off gang today. Annie, thank you for everything you do for the Glazov King and for your brilliant questions as always. We'll see you soon on the Glazov King. Good night.